precisely. I need to track the sun very precisely. Otherwise, I will lift uh, the, the, the image will shift and I won't be able to collect the light. Now, luminous concentrators is a very cool idea which avoids this problem. But of course, it has other problems which we'll talk about. But it's a really, really cool idea, and you should be aware of it because it's a type of concentrator that doesn't require this kind of an optical. This type of optical design requires other types of optical designs. It has many other uses as well. So, first of all, uh, why are we talking about this? It, it, the main reason is it reduces cost. It's a very cheap way to do concentration. It can potentially increase efficiency, although that is a big challenge nowadays. It can be integrated with buildings because it's kind of it, it's like it has the same form factor as a window, and it's not tracking, as I said in the very beginning. Okay. So, what does it look like? It is simply a piece of glass or plastic, okay, completely transparent. Light comes in from the top, but it, the plastic or the glass is embedded with material that can absorb the light and re-emit it. It fluoresces and that, at a different wavelength. And that fluorescence is then trapped within that glass and like a fiber optic, it is guided to the ends of the glass. So if you look at the ends of the glass, they glow because all the light essentially ends up there. And, and if you put a solar cell on the edges of this glass and absorb that light, you can convert it to energy. That's like it. And the really cool thing is that you can change the color. So you can make it red, yellow, green, blue, whatever, by changing the materials that absorb and emit the fluorescence. And as you can see, they look like windows, so they can be embedded into uh, buildings and so on as part of the windows and, the, and it's fully transparent so you can see through but it absorbs a portion of the light which is then redirected to the edges and is collected by solar cells. So very very cool interesting simple idea. Now why don't I have to track the sun in this case if you think about it. Now first of all what is the concentration factor here? So uh, the concentration factor is defined as my collection area divided by my solar cell size, right? My input area divided by my output area. Remember for CPC, we had that fact. Here, my input is this total area of this window. And my output is just the area of the edge. So it's L times W, length times width, divided by L times thickness times two plus W times thickness times two. By two, because I have two sides, I have four sides. Anyway, you can work it out. What that means is that, and again, I don't need to track. I don't care which way the light comes in. I can keep, you might say, oh, I can do infinite concentration. I can make these windows huge. Unfortunately, there are other problems that come to it. So we'll talk about that. So that's, I mean, the, these possibilities are what makes it very interesting. So how does it work? Again, just remind ourselves uh, what I just said, repeat myself, sorry. The luminescent solar concentrator or LSC consists of a transparent material that has been doped with a fluorophore capable of absorbing incident solar radiation and em emitting fluorescent photons. What does that mean? This is what it looks like. It's, it's doped with these molecules which absorb the solar radiation as expected, but instead of converting it into current directly, it simply fluoresces, it emits light, it's usually at a particular wavelength. And that light is shown by these red arrows, is basically trapped within this slab, acting like a fiber optic, essentially. It's called a slab waveguide, technically. And it read, uh, the light essentially ends up at the edges and they're absorbed by the solar cells. So, um, again, a, a more detailed view here, light comes in, it refracts by Snell's law, a portion of the light is, escapes, as we know. Then it's absorbed by this molecule, we call it a dye molecule, it doesn't have to be a, an organic molecule, it can be other things as well. And it emits fluorescent photons in all directions, it's omnidirectional. And then a portion of it gets guided inside here by total internal reflection. So this angle, theta is larger than the critical angle, it'll be trapped, right? It'll get trapped until it reaches the edge, which is the solar cell. We all know this from the loss of reflection and refraction. 
Now, what's really important is that this phenomena here is somewhat independent of the angle. I can come in at any angle, I'll still have this equation. I'm saying somewhat because there is still a loss associated with the reflections on the top surface, which is angle dependent. So you will still have some loss there. And uh, we've already answered this question and we'll, we'll look at this again. So I'm gonna not ask that right now. Okay, what are the challenges? So again, as I said before, uh, I mean, there are two challenges. Let me just come back here and say the, the scenario I mentioned. I can, uh, so again, let's think about what is the concentration factor in this picture here. My input is this area, right, the top area. My output is the solar cell. Maybe I have two of them, so I have two times that. So I might say, okay, if I make my input infinitely large, my size of my solar cells don't change. That means, I'm, can I make an infinite concentration, right? That, that, that would be a, a natural question to ask. The answer is no. And the reason is these fluorescent photons, if you, if you make this infinitely large, the problem is that these solar cells now are really far away from where the light is generated. That means these fluorescent photons have to travel a very long distance to reach these solar cells. And the longer they travel, they can encounter many loss mechanisms and they will not end up at the solar cell. In fact, you can show theoretically that it is still limited by thermodynamics. And we'll look at the loss mechanism shortly. So that's a fundamental limitation. And it'll become more clear when we talk about the loss mechanisms. But the other uh, engineering problem is that they typically have low efficiency and they have very poor photostability, typically. I mean, not always. There's a lot of people trying to improve this. Now, what does that mean? Uh, poor photostability is because organic materials, if you put them in the sunshine under UV light, they degrade. So some of you may know, like uh, glasses, uh, if you have polycarbonate and if you use it for several years outside and so on, it'll start yellowing. Right? This is the degradation of polymer in the presence of UV light. Exact same thing happens here. But of course, in the case of solar cells, yellowing means you're absorbing light, you're not creating the fluorescent photons that you are, that are desirable for the solar cells. So, and, and that's what this plot shows is basically the relative short circuit current density, so it's normalized to one, as a function of time at different temperatures. In this case, it's temperature. So higher the temperature, it degrades quick, quickly. So this is the lowest temperature, this is the highest temperature. So it falls down very fast with time. Uh, uh, the, the temperature refers to uh, uh, the second factor here, heat. Of course, the same thing happens with UV as well. So concentration onto organic dyes may not be great. Uh, new materials are being investigated to solve this problem. Things like quantum dots, rare materials and semiconductor polymers. Uh, can you all, I mean, maybe let's take a minute and see. I, I told you about a problem and we've talked about optics and how to solve problems in our projects. Can you all think of uh, some optical solution to this problem. And I'll let you all think about it for a minute and feel free to talk. I know this is a small group, but feel free to talk. Or feel free to shout out, but I want you all to think about it. Also on Zoom, if you, if you have, you can put it on chat. Anyone? So think about what, where the problem is coming from. I mentioned UV and heat. Yeah? If you have a sacrificial polycarbonate layer, it could be in the plate. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, uh, so Chauncey suggested, could we somehow reduce the UV radiation of the, of the uh, active material by placing a essentially a filter on top? which absorbs UV, that's an option, yeah. Uh, you can get somehow get rid of the UV. I mean, for instance, that's what they do with sunglasses, right? Some of these sunglasses to protect you, they have UV filters, obviously. And that, those last longer. Any other suggestions? You can cool it, yeah. It's an obvious thing also, yeah, great. The cooling, cooling is not easy, but definitely doable. 
Yeah, so those are good. I mean, opt what does optically uh, cooling mean optically? Because thermal photons are what creates heat from the sun, right? It's not, it's not conduction. It's not, the sun's not touching the, sort of the glass. It's thermal photons. So you have to somehow filter out the thermal photons. That would be an optical solution. Okay, the long wavelength photons, because they're not absorbed anyway. They simply produce heat, but good suggestions. Now, Let's look a little bit closely at the loss mechanism. This is important because I want you to understand where, what's happening to the light. The, the equation itself is very simple. It's not that complicated, but it's really the physics that's important. So what is efficiency? Efficiency is simply the fraction of incident power that reaches the, excuse me, the solar cell. We're not talking about the efficiency of the solar cell, the efficiency of photons. If I have one photon that came into my window, what is the probability that will end up at the solar cell? That's this efficiency. So you have to take this efficiency and multiply by the efficiency of the solar cell to get the full system efficiency. Okay, so uh, some of the definitions clear. So it's a fraction of incident power that reaches the edge Eta uh, LSE. So uh, there are many terms here, and we'll go through each of them. So it's just a product of very lost mechanisms, essentially. The first term is very simple. It's simply uh, one minus r. So the, uh, one minus r is the fraction of incident light is transmitted into the sheet, into or into the glass, uh, um, uh, which we know is be simply because of the Fresnel reflections. It's a bunch of light gets gets lost from the top surface. The rest of it goes in. So if you take the one minus what's lost, you get the transmitted efficiency. And we know this equation from before in the, our lecture on anti reflection coatings where. Uh, uh, the uh, reflectance or the, uh, the, the fraction of light that's lost by reflection is simply n minus one squared by n plus one squared by n is the refractive index of the material. If we say n is 1.5, that's about a 4% loss. Now, uh, the next, so that's very easy. So, you know, 96% uh, passes through. PTIR is simply the probability of total internal reflection, which uh, is the cone angle that defines the escape cone, right? So if you have angles less than the critical angle, it will escape the material. All the angles larger than the critical angle is trapped. So you need to find the fraction of that. We talked about this when we talked about LEDs in the past. And this turns out to be related to, of course, the critical angle, which is sine inverse of one over N and the probability of total interreflection. You can say it, 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 it's simply the uh, uh, square root of one minus one over n squared or square root of one minus sine theta c squared or cos theta c. You can prove this, but in any case, I'm just going to state it here. This turns out to be about 75% in the case of n equals 1.5. 1.5 is a reasonable number for most glasses and plastics. So that's why it's used. Now, uh, this is something uh, we'll talk about reabsorption shortly, but so just keep put that aside for the time being. Then, whoops. Then the next term, eta absorption. We should go to the next one. Is the absorption efficiency? This is the 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 luminescent solar concentrator must absorb the greatest possible range of wavelengths with photo energies greater than the band gap of the cells used. So that's the absorption efficiency. So what does that mean? So for silicon, you want the LSA to absorb all the wavelengths with the energy greater than the band gap of silicon, which corresponds to wavelength less than 950 nanometers. And you want it to emit in that region which silicon can absorb very efficiently. Remember when we talk about uh, multi-junction cells, we said a slice of those bands are what are absorbed efficiently. In the case of silicon, this turns out to be that slice. Now, of course, that is determined by the band gap. We'll talk more about this, by the way, on, in the, uh, when we talk about spectrum splitting. So silicon has the highest spectral absorption in this very small, narrow band, 950 to 1,000 nanometers. So in this, the, we, we want the dye molecules to absorb this very efficiently and emit in this region very efficiently. The typical numbers are about 70, 71%. The next term is the photoluminescence or uh, luminescent or fluorescent quantum yield, which is basically saying, okay, if I absorb one photon, how many fluorescent photons do I emit? Or uh, more, more accurate statement is if I, if I absorb 100 photons, how many fluorescent photons do I emit? Is it 100? That will be 100% efficient. Is it 50? That will be 50% efficient, so on and so forth. 
This is the probability that an excited fluorophore will decay by emission of a fluorescent photon. Okay. Now, this uh, process is, uh, is, is very important and interesting and useful to understand uh, what this means. It's, it's basically, the number of emitted photons divided by the number of excited molecules or the number of photons that are absorbed, which is the input, times 100. And generally, it's pretty high if it's engineered pro properly. It's about 95%. Um, the last term here, uh, sorry, not the last term. The next term here is the area Stokes. This is called the Stokes efficiency. And we'll see what that means soon because it's related to what's called the Stokes shift in fluorescence. And let's see what that means. The typical number here is about 75%. So what is fluorescence? Uh, crash course uh, from high school physics, hopefully. Uh, the, what, what is fluorescence? There's an excitation light comes in. Uh, this is the band diagram, energy band diagram of the fluorescent molecule approximately. So you have a ground state and then you have excited, bunch of excited states. The difference between the, no longer, we're not talking about balanced band and conduction band because it's not a crystal, it's a molecule, right? It's an organic dye molecule or something like that, which means it has many orbitals and so on. So it's not like a very nice separation like a crystal. Sometimes it can be, but that's another discussion. Anyway, excitation light comes in, lots of energy, that's green. The molecule gets, absorbs this photon and gets excited to uh, one of the excited states. Right? This is the, the quantum mechanical excitation that happens. Then it relaxes very quickly. That, that, let's ignore that for the time being. This is called thermalization. We'll talk more about it later. Then it relaxes again to the ground state by a radiative, radi radiative decay, which means that it will emit a photon. That photon, as you can see, has goes through. Uh, this photon is red. So this energy difference between the ground state and this level is smaller than the energy difference between the ground state and this level. Okay, so that loss represented by this dashed line here is what's referred to the efficiency of strokes. Now, if you look at it in spectrum, what does it mean? You can plot the excitation light looks shown by this blue curve, and the emission light is red shifted. It's in this shown by the red curve. So in other words, emission, excitation happens with high energy photons. Emission happens with slightly lower energy photons. And that difference in energy is the Stokes loss or the Stokes efficiency. And there's always a small loss here. This is dictated by quantum mechanics. So it's not much you can do. And the, and the a typical number is about 75%. Uh, then the la last few terms are relatively simple. There's the host efficiency, which is simply saying that, okay, uh, we are saying this uh, host material, which is the polymer or the glass, is transparent, but it's not perfectly transparent. It's not 100%. It absorbs some light. Okay. So this is the loss from absorption of the trapped fluorescence by the host material. Many polymers absorb strongly in the near infrared, greater than 700 nanometers. For PMMA, which is a pretty decent material to work with plexiglass. This efficiency is about 95 to 98%. So five to 2% losses. EDA TAR is the efficiency of total internal reflection because remember the fluorescent photons are trapped within the slab. Now, theoretically it's hundred percent efficient. This is how total internal reflection is called total, right? Everything is reflected. However, in practice it's never hundred percent because Scratches, dust, dirt, water, et cetera, on the surface and scatter the light out, and that acts as losses, right? So it's in the, you know, a good number is 99.98. Finally, you can have something called self absorption. This is a very important loss mechanism, although uh, we're putting it at last, this is the most important loss mechanism, which essentially means that some of these fluorescent photons can be absorbed by the molecules themselves before they reach the solar cell. So it is a fraction of fluorescent photons reaching the edges of the uh, uh, LSC sheet, which is a solar cell, without being lost due to reabsorption. So if I may go back to this picture here, whoops. Wait, where is the, this picture here, you see the, the photon has been emitted here, let's say. Right? It's bouncing around. But some of these photons can be absorbed by the dye molecules and will not reach the solar cell. 
That is called reabsorption. And that's a very important loss mechanism. That is another loss mechanism that prevents me from making this window as large as I want. The larger I make it, the more probability that it'll get reabsorbed. And that number goes between 40 and 80%, typically something like that. And put it all together, if you multiply it all up, it becomes a very small number, about 5% or so. You can do it yourself, the homework. Okay, uh, we should also know what chloroform materials are used. Uh, there are all kinds of materials, typically. The organic dyes are the cheap ones, uh, rhodamine, TCM, chromarin, these are all uh, food dyes, things like that. All these are also chlorous, they're very cheap. More uh, recently, people are working on quantum dots. There are companies which make this uh, for displays. Uh, e Ink is a, a popular company, Q, Q, Q Dot, I think it's, it's a company which uses these um, for solar cells. They also use these for organic um, LEDs because quantum dots can emit the light. Um, actually, uh, uh, replacement organic LEDs. Organic LEDs are used in your Apple Watch, for instance. But quantum dots can do the same thing as they have better lifetime performance, right? Uh, and, and you can see why, right? Because you can see different colors here. You can tune the colors very, very nicely and they're very bright as well, very efficient. Um, uh, rare earth materials like lanthanides and so on are also used because they, they don't, they have the excellent stability. They don't, they don't degrade at all. But this is very, very specialized uh, uh, applications. The sheet materials are PMMA glass. Uh, the shape of the device is interesting. We only talked about rectangles, but you can imagine other things, circles, hexagons, and so on. The rectangle gives very non-uniform edge illumination. The solar cells you know, have these sharp corners that are not, not very good, you lose light there. So to avoid that, a circle would be nice, but you can't make circular solar cells. So, so that's a challenge. So people use hexagons sometimes. So things to think about as well. So I wanna play this video, which is a very nice uh, illustration of an example. Uh, yeah, let's play this quickly because we're almost running out of time. Uh, about a transparent solar cell from Michigan. I'm here on the waterfront in Detroit, and I'm talking about solar power. When you think of traditional solar panels, you think of those large black I'm going to fast forward through. Yes. An entire sky. Professor Lunt. Uh, Growing up, I grew up just outside of And there's often more area like in the, the windows, vertical footprint than there is in the rooftop panel. footprint. No, why is it so... Hey, why is it jumping around? I'm here on the waterfront in Detroit, and I'm talking about solar buildings in general. And there's often more area, and it's going to capture the oh, parts of the solar spectrum example. that you can't that's see with your eye. Like, so you it's going to capture the ultraviolet and near infrared parts of the solar spectrum. And that glowing infrared light gets shine guided light. to the edge you of the glass, see it here because where we mount very thin strips of solar cells. And that's going to convert that energy into electricity. The nice thing is that instead of using those very complex... So now we are in the Molecular and Organic Excitonics Laboratory. And so this is a fully assembled uh, prototype of this type of technology. So um, I guess what we can do at this point is just hook this up and show you kind of how it works. So what I'm going to do now is just hook up the solar concentrator. And we're going to shine the light onto the active layer. And the fan moves. Generating power. That's right. So with much bigger windows, with the actual power of intensity of the sun, that's right. You're going to do more than just be able to move a little fan. That's right. We're going to be able to power the building. Any building can start to uh, be a good solar collector now. So we can turn our solar farms into solar cities. You can go forward. <laughs> 